Well, hello there, scrub lords, and welcome to uh, another episode of Deblog Chats. And this one's going to be a long one, so uh, strap yourselves in and make sure you grab some popcorn. Uh, just go ahead and pause the video right now. All right, you ready? Okay, let's go. Okay, so we've got a lot to cover in this dev blog. Um, now, I realize that I haven't been exactly keeping up with these things as of late. Uh, things have been quite busy for me lately. I started a new job, and um, I also haven't been streaming all that much either because of it. Uh, as a result, um, content has been a bit lackluster lately. Also, on top of that, uh, it's taken me up until about a week and a half ago to uh, finally find a good source so I can talk properly talk about the Japanese um, the Japanese upcoming Japanese tanks in the way that I want to so it, props to you guys who sent me a link to the blog I'm going to link in the description below it is run by a lady by the name of Yoon A Sun I'm sorry if I'm butchering that Yoon um, but I'm gonna call her by her uh, official forum's nickname, uh, My Waffentrager. It's just easy for me to pronounce. Um, My Waffentrager is responsible for coming up with the uh, community Japanese te uh, tech tree, uh, and since then she has been hired by Gaijin to become their official Japanese tank consultant. So what she does is she actually goes to the Japanese archives, or she, uh, or she has somebody go there for her, and dig up information regarding Japanese uh, tanks and their development. Uh, and she's got a fantastic blog. I highly recommend it. And I'm going to be taking a lot of my material from that blog. So for those of you who read it on a regular basis, you're going to recognize some of the some of the material that I'm going to be talking about. And I am going to be quoting directly from her blog in a couple of cases. So those of you who get kind of pissed off whenever somebody can't just come up with original content, um, I know it's similar to reading stuff on the dev blog chats, which I despise as well. However, this is such good info that. I feel that there's no real way to um, uh, try and summarize it without uh, without missing some things. So I'm not going to read absolutely everything because I still want you guys to go check out her blog and I want you to read everything in detail. Also to make sure that I'm being corrected and I'm not getting things wrong. So Mai, if you're watching this video, I'll send you a link, obviously. Um, uh, please correct me in the comment section if I got anything wrong, please. I, I, I don't want to be giving out false information. In any case, um, right before we get started on Japanese tanks, though, I want to cover the couple of things that have come out regarding things slightly other than Japanese tanks. I want to talk about the Japanese CBT real quick for how and how that's going to work for those of you guys who are not familiar with it. And I want to talk about the Object 907, or is it the 906? The, the PT-85 and the uh, T-14T and... Uh, aircraft cockpits real quick. So before we get into Japanese tanks, let's go over that real quick. So quickly going over the Japanese CBT, for those of you guys who are not familiar with how Gaijin likes to release new tech trees, um, especially in regards to ground forces, since that's really the only new tech trees they've been releasing as of late, um, the CBT is going to work like this. There are two packages on the Gaijin.net store that they just released today as of the 6th of December 2016. Um, and they contain two vehicles, and I am going to go over those in the in the coming uh, devlog chats, so hold your horses there. Um, and you can purchase one of these two packages. They include uh, the first package, which is the um, uh, the cheapest one, includes the Chiha 120, which as the name suggests, is a variant of the Chiha, uh, armed with a 120mm gun. Now, I do not know whether that's experimental or not. I'm still waiting on Mai to update her blog um, with those two vehicles. So, we'll quickly cover them in the devlog chats here in a few minutes, but uh, for now, I'm just going to do a quick overview on what I know of the vehicles, which in terms of the Chiha 120 is very, very little. Um, that is $14, and it comes with 1,000 gold, 7 days of premium, and I believe a 3D modification, or a 3D, um, not a modification, uh, a 3D, uh, decoration. Uh, yeah, it comes with a Sakura 3D decoration. The other one is, uh, Heavy Tank number 6, which again, I will cover here in a few minutes, uh, which comes with the vehicle, uh, 1,000 gold, and 7 days of premium, and the Samurai Helmet, uh, 3D decoration, and that is, uh, 29 uh, or 30 US dollars, uh, you're gonna have to accommodate for euros or, uh, or whatever currency conversion is being used for your region. In any case, so $14.99 for the Chiha 120, and the uh, and $29.99 for heavy tank number six. 
And basically, by buying either of these packages, you get access to the Japanese uh, closed beta test, or Japanese Ground Forces closed beta test. So when 1.65 comes out, they're going to put the whole tech tree out there. However, only the people who have access to the CBT uh, are going to be able to research and buy every single vehicle in that tech tree until the release of 1.67. That's generally the way they. That's generally the way things work. Now I know it's not the most ideal system, and I know a lot of people get really salty when Gaijin does this sort of thing. But if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, they've put all this effort into these vehicles, and they've put they've set up they set up the tech trees in the best way they think they're going to work. However, the CBT process is there so that they can figure out uh, where they've gone wrong. And how they need to readjust the vehicles before it's uh, before everybody gets access to it. Now everybody is going to get access to the tier one Japanese vehicles. Um, that's how they always release it. <clears throat> and throughout 1.65's um, uh, period on the live server, uh, they're going to unlock different. They're going to unlock the tiers as um, as the CBT player base gets through them. So. Uh, so the first couple of weeks, it's probably going to be mostly tier one stuff. Maybe after two weeks, they'll release the um, the release tier two for the Japanese tanks. So those are going to be available, um, and then tier three, then tier four, and then when 1.67 comes out, they're going to release uh, um, they're going to release the entirety of the Japanese tech tree for everybody to play. Uh, so that's generally how it works. Now, for those of you who are somewhat concerned, I don't know why you would be, but for those of you who are concerned that I'm not going to be getting access to it, uh, I am going to be getting access uh, as a content creator. They generally give us access to these sort of things um, at the same time that everybody else does. So when the, when the 1.65 goes live, I'm going to get just as much of an opportunity to play uh, the Japanese uh, tech tree as anybody else does who buys these packages. Um, one of the nice perks of being a content creator is that you get free stuff. So in any case, uh, if you're concerned that I'm not going to be able to make content for this right off the bat, you're wrong. I am going to. So, and I do plan on making some content and plenty of unicorn reviews. And don't worry. Now, for the other updates that are coming out, and there are quite a few things that are getting people excited. First of all, we have um, the good possibility of boats coming in the next patch, uh, which is going to be quite interesting. I've been... Uh, testing the boats uh, off and on um, during the times that they have them available. Uh, I did that day one stream with them that, that I'm sure many of you tuned into, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Um, it, I'm very, very excited for how the uh, for how the War Thunder Naval Forces are going to turn out. However, the big news this week that just came out a couple days ago, um, and that is everybody really excited, um, is the one feature we've been asking for ever since War Thunder's been, well, ever since it it was, it was existed, was uh, the addition of cockpits for air, for bombers, especially. Uh, and they're finally going to be delivering that to us. I know that, I know more than a couple of friends who, uh, who are big sim guys uh, who stopped playing War Thunder because they, a lot of the, a lot of the aircraft that they really wanted to fly just didn't have cockpits. Uh, and uh, they really, really wanted that immersion uh, and feel of those aircraft, especially bombers. I mean, bombers have suffered in War Thunder, uh, especially in regards to lack of cockpits ever since the game's been in existence. Um, I mean, and the fact that a lot of these aircraft have been in the game since, like, since closed beta testing days, since when I was playing, I uh, started playing, like, back in 1.25 or something like that. I think I started playing around there. Um, the fact that they aren't in the game is a travesty. In any case, uh, we're finally getting that, and not just for bombers, all aircraft that do not have a cockpit are going to be getting one next patch, that, and I'm pretty sure that includes the new aircraft that are coming as well. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a huge deal, um, and it's one of the most anticipated features for War Thunder. Um, now, uh, one of the funny things that uh, happened to come up when they announced this was... Uh, one of the cockpits they had there is for an aircraft that's not even in the game yet that they haven't actually officially announced in the dev blog, and that's the HE-100. Um, and I'm just going to read the comment for it. Uh, let's see, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, Heinkel, uh, I think it's by Jinx Z. Uh, Heinkel HE-100 confirmed, and um, 
I don't even know how to pronounce that. Oishe? Oish? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, he says, no, it's a picture of a weather balloon. Nothing to see here. Uh, <laughs> so it's obvious when they put this together, they realized, um, crap. <laughs> uh, we kind of screwed up there. However, there is also a picture of the HE-100 showing the new X-ray camera. Um, and I'll, I'll put a picture of that up on screen there so you guys can see it. So HE-100 confirmed, uh, essentially. And so that's going to be kind of cool. Um, I know a lot of people have been looking forward to stuff like that for a while. I mean, especially for the cockpits. I mean, just a couple of pictures that they've released for us are just absolutely beautiful. Um, again, I am not much of an aircraft guy anymore. I played the crap out of aircraft way back in the day when, uh, way before War Thunder Ground Forces came out. And, I mean, even then, I'm excited for this. Like, I, I, I've reiterated time and time again that I'm not an airplane guy anymore. However, this is... This has kind of got me excited a little bit for airplanes, so I don't know. I'm, I might, I might give them a try again, or I might start playing them a little bit more. Just, if anything, just to ha just to try out some of these new cockpits. Now, I totally forgot to mention this when I was talking about the uh, about the aircraft. I was recording like an entirely different portion of the video, and I completely forgot to talk about this. Um, they're finally making a change to bombers in general in realistic and in combined arms. Uh, battles, meaning uh, battles with planes and tanks, uh, to bombers. And that is they are removing, finally, the 3D bombsite view that you get in third person for bombers. And what that effectively means is, is that you're not going to have those, do those pesky Dornier 217s flying in and dropping bombs on individual targets with ease, or, uh, or jet bombers like the Arado 234 blitzing the map and just bombing targets with pinpoint accuracy anymore. That's not going to be the case. Still, the, you might get bombed by them, but it's going. you're going to see far less of these vehicles now, and at least this is what I'm anticipating. Uh, because that element of... Uh, I don't want to say overpoweredness, but because that element of the bombers are now gone, it's going to require the bombers to uh, focus on using their... well, use their gun sight and use their bomb sight to actually use a... It introduces an element of skill into it, and it requires bombers, if they're going to bomb at any sort of reasonable altitude and utilize their bomb site with any reasonable degree of success, uh, that they're going to have to fly in straight lines, and they're going to have to be very, very vulnerable to air attack and or SPAA, depending on how high they're flying. So this is an excellent change, and a change that I've been asking for for ever because frankly it was one of my biggest pet peeves about uh rb and ab um tanks and simulator well not so much simulator but that's a different can of worms entirely but it was one of my biggest pet peeves about ground forces the fact that bombers could these strategic or tactical bombers uh could hit targets with such pinpoint accuracy because gaijin was essentially giving them a, a a site on the ground in third person that just is here. Just fly into the general area, drop your bombs, and you're going to land a bomb right on top of them. I mean, they might as well, guys might as well have introduced a system that dropped the bombs for them because uh, it was so accurate and it was, it was ridiculous. Uh, again, one of my biggest pet peeves of War Thunder Ground Forces was that, and they're finally getting rid of it. I am so happy. Thank you, Gaijin. <laughs> You have made a tanker very, very happy. Um, and I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, well, you should just bring more SPAA. Here's the problem. The amount of experience and credits you gain from playing SPAA is pretty minimal. I mean, it's already bad enough with War Thunder uh, Ground Force's uh, tank grind uh, and the amount of experience and uh, credits you get per match. It's already bad enough. Um, but when you're driving SPAA, you're pretty much completely limiting yourself to one or to one or two roles, depending on the SPAA you're driving, of course. If you're driving a ZSC-57, you might as well be a medium tank. But if you're, for example, driving a true SPAA, like an M163 VADS, you have one goal in life, and that is to kill aircraft. <laughs> and, and that's it. Um, you don't have other options. So the the amount of aircraft per SPAA ratio was there was a massive difference you're going to see far more aircraft than you were ever going to see SPAA um and because they're they're making this change to bombers it can only mean good things and uh, for ground forces and it's going to prioritize like they say in the dev blog here 
it's going to prioritize dive bombers and ground attackers, which are both vulnerable to SPAA and ground fire. And on top of that, it's going to require an element of skill uh, for, for those people who want to bring their Dornier 217 into a battle, who want to bring a, a B-29 into a battle. It's going to require an element of, an element of skill and an element of uh, knowing what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, rather than just going in, dropping a bunch of bombs uh, that will just destroy everything within a 200 meter radius and just flying away and getting off scot-free. So this is an excellent change and I cannot wait for it to be introduced into ground forces. In any case, uh, moving on swiftly here, uh, we've got a couple of new vehicles to discuss. Uh, I'm going to get the Tu-14T right out of the way. The, and this is an aircraft that I didn't even really know existed, I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, however, really does make sense for the rule it's intended for, and this is the TU-14T. Um, TU stands for Tupolev, as far as I'm concerned, and apparently, according to the devlog, uh, the T at the end of the, at the end of 14 stands for Torpedo, Torpedo Nos, I'm sorry, Torpedo Noset, Nosets. I'm sorry, Russians, I just butchered your language. I, I am very, very sorry about that. I, I don't speak Russian all that well. Um, uh, jet-powered Soviet torpedo bomber. So, that should be quite interesting, and the fact that it looks like it's based off the IL-28, uh, let's see, the T-14 and the IL-28 became the first series produced Soviet jet bombers. Okay, so essentially, there these were competing designs, uh, and the T-14T could drop torpedoes, so that's kind of cool. Um, and I'll put some p photos up there for you. It looks like a beautiful aircraft model. I mean, it, it astounds me every patch uh, how good these models get, and it's... It, it, they're just beautiful. I, I, I just can't get over them. I'm not much of an aircraft guy, like I've said before, but these models are just absolutely beautiful. I know a good aircraft one, or I know a beautiful aircraft when I see one. In any case, moving on here swiftly to the first tank, and I know it's been 15, 16, 17 minutes uh, before we actually got to ground forces, but... I needed to get those things out of the way. In any case, the very first vehicle of the devlog chats that is actually a ground pounder is the Object 906, uh, or as they call it, the River Mosquito. Essentially, this is the PT-85, um, and this is quite an interesting vehicle uh, for a multitude of reasons. Um, now, for those of you who are familiar with Soviet Tier 4, they have always struggled with the sort of fast, mobile um, vehicles that punch hard, in which almost every other nation seems to have. The Americans have plenty of these vehicles. Uh, the Germans have the Panther II, um, and the British have vehicles like the Carnarvon. Well, it, although the Carnarvon and the uh, Centurion are not exactly the fastest vehicles, I guess you could always make an argument for the Charioteer fulfilling that role. Uh, essentially, what I mean is that the Russians really struggle in the sort of medium to light tank department, uh, vehicles that are quite mobile, that hit hard, um, but may not have any armor whatsoever. Um, the PT-76 is not really that well suited for this, because it's a 5.7, and it's not really a good, it's not really a, a, tier, a proper tier 4 vehicle, um, and where it sits right now uh, at 5.7 is more than adequate. But the issue with the PT-76, well, is the fact that it has a 76mm gun, which despite firing post-war ammunition is pretty lackluster, um, all things considered. The APCR rounds have okay penetration, um, but again, it's APCR. Uh, the APHE rounds on it have abysmal penetration for its tier, just over 100mm, which is really quite bad. Um, and really the only shell that's of any use on that vehicle is the heat FS round, um, which has only 200 millimeters of penetration, which is enough to fight 6.7s, but it's just barely enough. Um, and if you encounter anything more powerful than, let's say a T29 or something, if you encounter anything like a T29 or something like that, you're going to have a bad day. So uh, again, the, the issue that the Russians have right now is is very, very bad mediums at 6.7. Um, they they have the T44-100, but that's a 7.0 vehicle, and it's not really fulfilling that proper gap. And what the hell is going on outside? Oh my god, never mind. Um, in any case, uh, th so the PT-85, I'm just going to call it the PT-85, it's much easier that way, um, is going to be a really, really cool addition. I'm actually looking forward to it. I don't really play Russian tanks all that much, but I am really looking forward to playing this vehicle. Um, 
I mean, it's got the same 85 millimeter as on the ASU 85, which everybody seems to hate on. Um, and I yet still haven't played that vehicle yet. I, and I really want to get my hands on it, but I'm still waiting on some uh, particular rentals right now. In any case, uh, so this 85 millimeter gun on the ASU 85, I already know the 85 millimeter on that vehicle is fantastic. 230 millimeters of penetration with its APC BC rounds, and then it gets a heat FS round with 300 millimeters of penetration exactly. And because it's a heat FS round, it, it's at all ranges, which is fantastic for uh, for its battle rating, at least the ASU 85, when that vehicle is concerned. So the fact that we're getting it on a turreted mobile chassis is that's also amphibious, might I add, um, is really, really quite cool. And that's going to be quite a threat on the battlefield, and I'm sure a lot of people are not going to be expecting it, especially the Germans, and the Russians do need a, uh, a very, very fast, mobile, hard-hitting vehicle, and I think the Object 906 is going to be, uh, is going to be quite the vehicle for that job. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, how well this vehicle performs, but only time will tell. Now, finally moving on to Japanese armor, I know I've taken 20 minutes to get to this point. However, there's going to be a lot to cover, so just sit down and prepare your anuses, because there is a lot here. In any case, we are going to start off, I believe, with the one of the first vehicles we're going to unlock in the Japanese tank line, and that's the iGo. Now, the iGo is going to be the very first medium tank that you get in the Japanese medium tank tech tree. Now, the iGo had come about... After the First World War, uh, in 1927, the Japanese had been looking into the effectiveness of tanks and how they had changed the face of warfare, especially in on the Western Front. Now, Japan was kind of scared because of this, because they had no major tank initiatives uh, of rearmament or organization of their own. Um, so they started by purchasing a couple of, um, of tanks. So they purchased three Vickers medium C tanks from Britain for additional influence in designing a mass produced tank. Um, and they had also purchased a few Mark IV, uh, female tanks and some series of Renault vehicles. So once the Japanese got all these vehicles there, they started, uh, testing some vehicles and testing how they should organize the crew. Um, and they eventually came to the iGo. Um, so the iGo was undergoing trials in 1929 and was accepted into service late in that year. Now, the first five pre-production vehicles uh, did not see combat until 1932 in Shanghai uh, because in that year, uh, the Sh Manchuria incidents uh, kicked off and the Chinese and the Japanese engaged in a full-out conflict. And so this was the very first time that uh, both sides had, or the Japanese had actually used their tanks, and they were deployed in the second independent tank company. In addition to this, they were also supported by 10 Renault tanks. Now, after the battle, all the crews were interviewed uh, to see how well the tanks had performed. They'd performed okay, they'd performed satisfactory, however, a couple of changes were recommended. One of the things the Japanese realized was that when the gun was elevated to a certain degree, uh, since the tank had no gun mantlet, uh, it actually left a gap in the armor where uh, Chinese troops could shoot at the tank crews. Uh, so that was quickly rectified by placing a steel shield around the gun um, to help cover up the crew when the gun was elevated or depressed uh, to a certain degree. Now, the first production uh, variants, the variants that had fought in Shanghai were pre-production vehicles. The, the first proper production vehicles were armed with a short-barreled 57mm gun. These vehicles were designated the Type 89 I Go Ku. Uh, which is K-O-U. I'm sorry for the Japanese people out there, or any Japanese listeners. I, I am going to butcher your language, and I'm going to do it over and over again. In any case, to follow this up, in, in 1933, there was a second production variant which set out to improve the frontal protection of the iGo. Now, this is where things get kind of confusing, because to add to the confusion of both of these vehicles... The, some of the second generation vehicles uh, did not, it will retain the same turret of the first generation. So things get a little bit confusing here. And then on top of that, there was a third variant of the vehicle. Um, and these vehicles are constantly changing pretty much every other year. Uh, and the variant, we're by the way, we're going to be getting in War Thunder is the late 1933 iteration of the vehicle. So there's quite a few different um, developments of the same vehicle, and it's 
gets quite confusing according to uh, my Waffenträger's blog here. Again, link down in the video description. I highly suggest you go read this article for yourself. Um, and I'm going over this as quickly as I can and in short uh, hand as I can. Um, so that way there's still stuff for you guys to read. In any case... So the vehicle was constantly reiterated on and improved. There were different cupola, cupolas, there were different turrets, uh, all these different improvements um, uh, continued on throughout the vehicle's service life. And then finally ending with the Atsu variant. Now, like I said before, this is going to be the very first medium tank you have in War Thunder, and for those of you guys who have watched Girls in Panzer and are screaming at me the entire way through this thing, yes, I know, this is the same Type 89 that's in the, uh, that's in the show Girls in Panzer for the Urai Girls Academy. Um, and this is, there's a famous scene, which, you know what, I'll just, I'll just put that scene on here. If that doesn't properly illustrate how small and cute this thing is, I, I, I don't know what does. Now, moving on here to the other vehicles, because we've got a lot to cover here. Let's move on to one of the more anticipated or one of the more... I don't know, underappreciated vehicles, I feel, of the uh, of all of these devlogs that have come out recently, and that's the Ho-Ai. Um, now, the Ho-Ai was actually mistakenly um, released, I believe, when they were not, when they released the Chi-Hei devblog. Um, it was, like, they had, they had mixed up with the, uh, with the videos, and had put the Ho-Ai in, in the, uh, in the video instead of the Chi-Hei, uh, <laughs> It kind of fucked up there, but it was it, it was still really cool. Uh, and when they finally announced it, a lot of people just kind of wrote this thing off as, as like, oh, it's just another one of those crappy Japanese tanks. Now, uh, initially, it, it definitely seems that way. However, this vehicle's a little bit special because uh, the whole eye is, in a lot of ways, very, very similar to the Panzer IV C or the, uh, or the or a lot of the early Panzer IVs with the short-barreled 75mm gun. Except this thing is about four times as powerful as a uh, as a Panzer IV. I mean, this thing's gun or shell, I should say, is going to make the IS-2 cry. Um, and if you think that's even entirely possible, um, let me just uh, let me just read to you what they've uh, what they've said here on the devlog real quick. I, I know I don't like reading from the devlog, but it's it's important. Um, this. This tank's cannon is uh, is known because of its truly murderous shells. The Hawaii's ammunition complement includes a semi-armor piercing cavity uh, with a well, a semi-armor piercing round with a cavity filled with 460 grams of TNT. That is greater than the TNT content of Soviet cavity charges for the short-barreled 75 millimeter cannon. It's three times as powerful. As the as the Soviet 76 millimeter guns, and it's pretty much twice as powerful as the shells fired from the uh, D25T 122 millimeter gun. I mean, I think the IS-2 only has about a 210 grams of explosives. This is 460, and it's like half the size. I mean, or just over half the size. Like this is insane. Now, granted, the it, because it's a semi-armor piercing round, the penetration is going to be quite poor, but if you penetrate with this round, it's a one-shot kill, guaranteed. <laughs> like, I, I don't care, like, how powerful your tank is. Uh, if 460 grams is no joke. Um, and the whole eye, I feel, perfectly illustrates the Japanese um, in, their in their sort of flavor that they're going to bring to the table. Um, light vehicles, generally very fast, with very little armor, but with shells that have per generally poor penetration for their tier, but they hit massively hard. If you penetrate with one of the Japanese APHE shells that we're going to be getting next patch, you're going to do a lot of damage. <laughs> Even with like 47 and 57 millimeter cannons. Like, it's going to be quite devastating how, how crazy these APHE rounds are 
going to be. And those people who love one-shotting things are going to really like the Japanese vehicles if they can make them work. And like I said earlier, this was basically developed with the same general concept as the German Panzer IV uh, when it was initially developed. Um, and the idea with this was you would have a uh, an inf sort of an infantry support tank that would destroy enemy pillboxes and fortifications um, and help support the infantry advance. Uh, however, only I think about five of these, five to 30, I think it was 30 of these vehicles. Let me go check real quick. So yes, it was 30 vehicles and they were all confined to the Japanese mainland, so they never left Japan. Uh, however, if these vehicles had seen combat, they would have been quite effective in knocking out enemy fortifications. The problem with these vehicles are, especially in the, uh, in the Pacific Island hopping campaigns the Americans were doing, is that the Japanese were generally on the defensive. So a vehicle like this would have very, very little purpose, and it would really only be effective if they were using it for attack, because... Um, I mean, although the high explosive shells would have been quite useful against uh, American infantry, um, against vehicles like the Sherman, it would have really struggled. Now, the Japanese did develop a heat round, a shaped charge round for, uh, for this vehicle, which could penetrate about 100 millimeters of armor at any range. Um, and it was, according to testing, it was able to penetrate the front of a captured Sherman at 800 meters with the heat round. So it can defend itself. Um, but really, this thing's main... Uh, I guess I should say main strength it's going to be is the is going to be the power of its APHE round. So if you can get a penetration with that round, it's going to seriously ruin somebody's day. Um, now, according to uh, or according to my Waffenteiger's blog post, or blog post, uh, Jesus Christ, I can't even speak English today. According to the blog post, uh, this the standard APHE ammunition had about seventy millimeters of penetration at one hundred meters. And it had a pretty poor muzzle velocity as well because of the short barrel. So don't expect miracles at long range with this shell. Really, your only chance of penetrating a Sherman with the standard rounds on this thing is going to be at very, very close range or at, at shooting the side armor of the American tank. In any case, let's move on to some other vehicles here. Now, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, a quick look at the uh, the Honey 3. Now the Honey series of vehicles is very very similar to the German Martyrs. They are they say on the dev blog post the Japanese Martyr. Um, and essentially it was an attempt like a lot of other nations to take a um, a basic standard anti-tank gun and mount it on a self-propelled chassis in order to help combat enemy tanks. This, uh, this need had first come about in 1939 during the Nomon Han incident against the Soviets, because the Soviets had deployed large numbers of tanks against the Japanese, and they realized that the 47mm and 57mm guns, uh, especially the shorter barreled ones on a lot of their tanks in that theater, simply weren't cutting it. So the Japanese started the Honey project, and so the first vehicle, the Honey 1, uh, was essentially just a chi hob with the turret removed and a, a makeshift gun shield stuck on the uh, stuck on the uh, superstructure and a Type 90 75 millimeter field cannon stuck in the uh, stuck in the gun shield. Now the vehicle had two serious problems. The first one being that it was open topped and there was very very little protection for the gun crew. And the second being there was no direct vision periscope, uh, so there was no direct sight uh, in line with the gun. So it, it made aiming quite difficult. Uh, these issues would not be solved until mid-1943, and it wasn't until uh, late 44 that another prototype was ready that had, that had figured out most of these issues, which ended up being the Honey 3. Now, another big improvement with the Honey 3 was the replacement of the Type 90 75mm field gun with the Type 3 75mm gun, which is well known for being used on the Chi Nu medium tank, which we've already discussed in uh, my previous Scrub Chats video. So, this vehicle not only got it, it, most of its main issues fixed, but it also got a proper anti-tank gun. Now, the initial Type 1 APHE round that it got performed very, very poorly in testing. It was only like s just over 600 meters per second muzzle velocity, um, and it could only penetrate something in the range of like 89 millimeters of armor at 500 meters. Like, it was, it was pretty piss poor. Um... Later on, they changed the shell composition to the Type 1, uh, let me see here, the Type 1 Tokoko, um, which had an improved muzzle velocity of 683 meters per second and was capable of penetrating 100 millimeters of RHA, uh, rolled homogenous armor, at 500 yards and 85 millimeters at 1,000 yards. Uh, so... 
it, the gun got a got a pretty big improvement with the with an upgraded ammunition type. So we'll probably see that in game. We'll probably see the Type One APHE shell, and then we'll probably see the Type One Tokoko AP round, which appears to be a solid shot round. So it's it's probably going to end up being like an upgrade. So it's most likely going to be one of the modifications you unlock when you get the Honey Three. Now, only 41 of these things were produced, and they were restricted to the Japanese mainland, so like many of other the, many of these vehicles we're about to talk about today, uh, it didn't really see any combat service. It, it was just, there was no, there wasn't even resources to transport these vehicles to the fighting at that point, let alone, uh, let alone just getting them ready. So... 41 of these things were built, and they stayed on the Japanese mainland and never saw any combat. Before I go, though, it should be mentioned the vehicle actually could depress its gun uh, to 15 degrees. A lot of these Japanese tanks are going to have excellent gun depression. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to wait and see how well these vehicles uh, do because if they have that if that's going to be like the mainstay of the Japanese then having like 15 degrees uh, or 10 degrees plus of gun depression that's going to be a massive boon for these vehicles and it's also going to uh, dramatically influence how they play. So moving on here to the next vehicle in the series uh, we're going to be talking about the Soki which is the very first Japanese anti-aircraft vehicle introduced or announced for War Thunder. Now it would be silly if the Japanese didn't have any SPAA vehicles. Um, however since uh, my Waffenträger hasn't actually posted a an official blog post on the subject um, my knowledge again is going to be very very limited of this vehicle. Um, so it appears to be just a modification of the Type 98 KNE, which appears to have a superstructure built on top of it, mounting a fully rotating mount, which has two 20 millimeter, uh, cannons mounted on it. Um, they look a lot like the 20 millimeter Japanese anti-tank rifles, but I could be completely wrong about that, uh, note. So basically take that for what it's worth and with a grain of salt. In any case... Not much to say about this vehicle. It, essentially, it's kind of like the Japanese Flak Panzer One. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, again, I'm not sure exactly what the Japanese thought processes was when uh, developing this vehicle because I don't know anything about Japanese tank development. However, I'm sure that my Waffenträger will post something on this vehicle by the end of the week. So make sure you guys check her blog uh, sometime Friday or Saturday. Now, moving on to one of the, I think it's the third last vehicle in this video, uh, we're going to talk about the Type 61 MBT. Now, I know I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but uh, I'm kind of going with these things how I feel they should, uh, the order they should go, and I want to kind of save the last two vehicles for uh, for something a little bit separate. Uh, so the Type 61, the Japanese style pattern, so this is the ultimate um, development or like this is what the STA uh, v sort of a series of vehicles developed into. So the Japanese had the STA-1, the STA-2, the STA-3, and the STA-4. Um, and all f four of these vehicles had slightly different design concepts. And essentially, the problem with the Type 61 is that it was hampered by a constant series of changing requirements. Um, the Japanese wanted a light vehicle that was easy to transport because the Japanese terrain, it's very, very mountainous, not a lot of flat open ground, um, and they needed their vehicles to be mobile, um, low profile, and easy to transport on rail, uh, or by rail. So it took the Japanese until the mid fifties, uh, to actually develop this vehicle after the, uh, after the, um, Americans had allowed them to create the Japanese Self-Defense Force. Um, initially, the Japanese Self-Defense Force had used American tanks like the uh, M24 Chaffee and the Sherman. However, both of these vehicles were outdated and they just didn't suit the Japanese terrain all that well. Uh, there was just, it just wasn't um, the proper vehicle the Japanese needed. It was a stopgap measure. So the Type 61 was supposed to be the, the Japanese sort of answer to uh, to their issues with the American Sherman and the um, and the Chaffee, the biggest issue with the with the Chaffee was that it had a very very poor armament on it. The uh, the 75 millimeter gun on it, while good for its period, uh, when it was uh, when the 75 millimeter gun was being fitted to that vehicle, it was okay. Um, 
it, by the time the Japanese got their hands on it, it was completely outdated. Uh, the Sherman, uh, while, and while having a decent armament of the 76mm gun, still wasn't totally ideal, um, and on top of that, the vehicle was just too heavy for Japanese terrain. Like, it just wasn't, it wasn't properly able to be moved by rail along through the Japanese railway tunnels and had a lot of other issues. So, the Japanese started developing the Type 61 through the STA series of vehicles like I already covered, um, and every single one of these vehicles had different sort of objectives trying to accomplish it, and the Japanese initially started off with like a 25-ton requirement, then they jumped to like a 35-ton requirement, and they, they kept changing their, they kept changing the um, specifications for the vehicle, and what ended up happening was so many things got changed that the vehicle, by the time they got their vehicle in the late 50s, um, it was totally outdated and it was totally unsuited for, uh, or it wasn't totally unsuited, but it was, it, it wasn't worth it anymore. Like it, the, the cost of the vehicle, uh, to build had gone up significantly than it should have been. It was way over budget. Uh, it took way too long to develop. And by the time it was put into service, there were far better vehicles on the, on the market. Like you had vehicles out there like the Leopard 1 at this point. Um, and the Chieftain was being developed. So... It, you had all of these other extremely powerful vehicles, and this thing is essentially just a Japanese M46 Patton. Um, so, and could you imagine this thing having to go up against T-54s? It, it wasn't going to end well for the Japanese. So, uh, the Type 61 remained in service for quite a long time, even though it was pretty much completely obsolete by the time they got it. Uh, and it wasn't supplanted until they got the uh the type 74 which we will talk about uh when they whenever they release the news for it in the dev blog now talk, quickly talking about its armament the type 61 was armed with the uh american with a variant of the american m3a 190 millimeter cannon they uh changed the muzzle brake for it and it it's most likely going to have a lot of the same ammunition types that the american vehicles are going to have um, so if you've been playing the M46 Patton recently, it's going to behave a lot like that vehicle. It's going to have mobility very similar to that vehicle. Um, it's going to have, uh, the same ammunition types as that vehicle. Now, whether or not it's going to have the upgraded heat round, like the heat FS round that the uh, M47 gets remains to be seen. Um, however, it should a, at very minimum have the heat round that the M46 has, which has like two 10 millimeters of penetration or something like that. It's going to get APHE. It's going to get its crappy standard a, uh, AP round. It's probably going to get a crappy APCR round, something along those lines. Again, essentially a Japanese, a Japanese uh, M46 pattern is the best way I can describe it, just much lighter. Now, coming to uh, near the end of the video, we're going to discuss uh, two vehicles real quickly. Well, the second one, not so quickly, but the first one, we're going to discuss as best as, to the greatest extent of my knowledge, um, and that's going to be the Chiha 120. Uh, there's going to be not much to say about this vehicle uh, again because uh, my Waffen Trigger hasn't posted anything for it, and they just announced it today. Um, and like I said before, this comes with the closed beta, one of the closed beta test packs that you purchase uh, to get into the Japanese ground forces testing. Um, and essentially, it's a Chiha with a 120 millimeter stuck in that turret. And now, I have no idea how they possibly managed to fit a 120 millimeter gun, even with that stubby of a barrel, into that small of a turret. But I, I guess we'll have to wait until uh, until uh, my post something on it. Uh, in regards to its role, the only thing I could see this thing even remotely being used for is close support. It's essentially going to be like an like a whole eye on steroids. Um, Whereas the 75 millimeter gun on the it was equipped on the on the whole eye, this vehicle's got a 120 millimeter gun. Um, again, how they managed to fit that big of a gun into that small of a turret, I don't think I will ever know. Um, at least until I post something on it. <clears throat> so, if you're from if you're if you've read up on the Chiha and the development of that vehicle, then you're going to be quite familiar with how this vehicle is going to turn out. Except it's going to have a very 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 big gun for its tier. It's going to be apparently ranked two. Um, my best guess for its battle rating is probably going to be three point three at minimum. Uh, probably even like four point three or something like that or four point oh. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but those are my guesses. Uh, in any case, let's move on to the final vehicle of the uh, 
of this video, and holy shit, it is 45 minutes, and I really need to wrap this up. In any case, moving on to the very last vehicle of this video. Holy crap, we're finally at the end. In any case, uh, the last vehicle we're going to be discussing today is the Heavy Tank Number 6. Uh, now, a lot, of the, a lot of people have been requesting this vehicle ever since, uh, basically, the Japanese came out in World of Tanks. Uh, and the, uh, like, Wargaming has a pretty similar policy whenever they release, whenever they're about to release a new uh, tech tree. They will release a premium vehicle that people can buy, um, so that way they can start training up their crews for when that uh, line comes out. Um, <clears throat> however... Uh, the, what the Japanese got was the heavy tank number six, which is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a Japanese purchased Tiger. Now, essentially what had happened with this vehicle was the, the, the Japanese, uh, General Hiroshi Oshima, uh, which is the Japanese ambassador to Berlin, uh, he had, he had visited the Eastern Front in Russia and had seen, uh, demonstrations of the Tiger, uh, of the Tiger One. Um, and in May, uh, 1943, the Japanese had offered to buy a prototype of the, or not a prototype, they had offered to buy a, a full-size Tiger One. they would basically be disassembled and sent to them, and buy the blueprints for it. I'm not exactly sure how much they, uh, how much they paid for it. I heard somewhere was something like in the range of 350,000 Reichsmarks or something like that. I don't know the exact number, I could be totally wrong on that, but it was something Reichsmarks. That's all I know. Um, and the idea was they would set, they would, pack all this stuff up in a U-boat and send it to the Japanese. Um, to my knowledge, uh, only the plans made it to the Japanese. The, uh, the U-boat carrying the Tiger itself was sunk, but, uh, again, we'll have to wait and see when my Waffentrager releases the dev blog officially for the Heavy Tank Number 6 to get the specifics on that. Um, however, the Japanese had purchased a, uh, the Tiger E, and there are, there are there's a photo out there uh, with uh, General Hiroshi Oshima um, riding a, a Tiger H1, and a lot of people saw that as the actual prototype that was sent to Japan. That's not the actual prototype. That's actually a German Tiger H1 uh, that he was um, that he was given a ride in uh, and shown about on the Eastern Front. That was basically one of the pictures from the from the presentation of the vehicle to the Japanese. So. It, the Japanese did purchase a Tiger, uh, whether or not it actually got there, I'm not sure. Um, and if the Japanese, even if the Japanese had gotten this vehicle, I'm sure the Japanese would have realized that it was just totally unsuited for Japanese terrain, um, and getting, and just getting this thing deployed to anywhere in the theater would have been a major proposition in and of itself. So I can't see this thing, uh, even if the Japanese had gotten one, uh, have ever left have ever have left the mainland uh like i said before the japanese simply did not have the capacity to move such heavy vehicles and this was also the case with the oi um which it, funnily enough my has a great uh, uh a blog post a couple of blog posts on it so I, I highly recommend you guys go and read that as well in any case this vehicle has or this video i jesus i've been talking for so long that my voice is going and uh I can't even speak English anymore. In any case, thank you guys for listening. This has been a mega episode of Devlog Chats, I'm sure you will agree. And I hope you guys all really enjoyed the the information that you guys got. And again, go check out uh, Sensha Tank Manual. Uh, link in the video description, like I've said about a trillion times beforehand. Uh, and I highly suggest that you read up on that, share it with all your friends, get the word out on it, because it's really, really interesting stuff. In any case... Thank you guys for listening. This has been Many Miles Away. Keep your tracks checked, keep your binos in place, keep around in the tube, and I will see you guys in the next video.